it over to you. All right, thank you, Delilah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to uh, be in this session. I hope you find something useful from it, and I want to apologize right up front for not being able to be there in person. And I want to say thank you to the Cahia Board and their um, generosity in allowing me to present in this fashion. Hopefully, you'll uh, enjoy it. It's going to be a little different, obviously, since I can't be there physically, and, and we'll try and compensate for that in a way that I will share with you in just a moment. Uh, my background has been in adult education since 1998. I started at Ohio Christian University. At that time, it was Circleville Bible College and worked there for 10 years and have literally done every aspect of the job from, uh, from the very outset uh, of putting together programs and putting together the entire program for uh, adult degree completion. So I've worked in this for a long time. Along the way, God has allowed me to have several um, opportunities, you might say, for growth and experience and to be able to um, perhaps see how different processes work together. And I've presented here at Cahia in the past on curriculum-related issues and on enrollment-related issues. And today I'm going to share with you some information about faculty and of course, as we were talking before everybody came in the room, we have eight campuses, and so there is some familiarity also with the care and feeding of eight campus sites and all that goes into the parts and pieces of that, and it's been pretty exciting. Ron Pertle, who's right there with you all, wave your hand, Ron, they all know who you are probably, but Ron Pertle is, is, works with me in this regards and has done a fabulous job just uh, in the last two years of helping relocate two campuses to brand new sites and has done a tremendous job. Uh, Ron has just, just done phenomenal with that. So I'm sure he'll be able to help you. Also, if you want to know more about multiple campus sites, uh, Audrey Kelleher, uh, <laughs> that's what she does. She literally is the queen of multiple campus sites. So she'd be able to answer any questions as well. The product we're using for this presentation is called Zoom. We have been using Adobe Connect at our campus. And at all of our campuses, but there have been some some issues a little bit with that, not the least of which has been that the license was coming up for renewal, and we discovered that Zoom was a lot cheaper and began to experiment with it and have actually fallen in love with it. It works much smoother and much easier than Adobe Connect, and so that's the product we're using. So again, if you want to know more about that product, I'm certainly available, but also, Audrey Kelleher works with it on a regular basis as well. So, that being said, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to jump over and begin the presentation. And hopefully, you will find some information along the way that's helpful to you. As we go through the presentation, there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And because the audio is not always as easy to work with, I'd like you to do this with me. Take out uh, your device that has a browser capability. It can be a phone, it might be a tablet, it could be a computer, any device that you have that has internet capability and log into your browser and put in slido.com, S-L-I-D-O dot C-O-M in your browser. I'll give you a second to do that. After you've got slido.com in your browser and you've opened it up, it'll ask you for an event code. The event code is 5092-5092. If you will put in event code 5092, it will pop up a page that will look something, well, um, there are going to be two tabs at the top of your page. Let me just put it that way. Uh, one of the tabs at the top of your page will say questions. One will say polls. And under the questions tab, I'd like you to do this with me as an experiment here. What one question would you like answered in this presentation? So I'll give you a couple of seconds to type in a question so that you can see how that shows up on your screen. Uh, what one question, if you had a question about f anything related, any, literally anything related to faculty, there's probably nothing I haven't seen. If you have any question related to faculty at all that you'd like to have answered, go ahead and type it in your, in your browser in that area right now and hit post and it'll pop up on the screen on your device and you'll be able to see that. And I'll wait until we get a couple of questions posted here.
All right, you can see there are three questions over there on the side. And you have the capability of hitting that little thumb beside the question if you choose to. If you do that, it will elevate the question to the top of the list based on the number of votes. And as we go through this procession, I will make sure to answer those in the order that they're ranked. So if you read down through the question and you want to know which of these seems to be the best answer, uh, I just encourage, or which question you would like to have answered first, just hit the like button and it'll pop up. Go ahead and hit like on one of those and you'll see that how, how that works. You see how that's already moving the questions around? All the way through the presentation, if you have questions about anything that I'm sharing with you, you can either stop me on the way or type it in, but I've already discovered that the microphone on your end is difficult for me to hear. And so it might require you to be exceptionally loud to be able to get that, but if you post your question here, we will get to it, and as you rank the questions, then it'll be easier for us to be able to get the right questions answered. Now I'd like you to go to the poll tab, and if you go into the poll tab, you can see I've already got a poll posted. So if you go over to polls, you can see there is a poll that's being posted, and as you look at the, um, At the website here, you can see that it's going to put the words up there and it's building its little word cloud right now. And that's what it's going to be doing in this particular one. It's building a word cloud. There will be three or four polls spread throughout the presentation. Uh, three people have responded so far. What one word or short phrase would you use to describe your experience so far? Uh, as you type that in, it'll begin to build a word cloud in this particular one so that we can see that. and. Uh, it looks like we've gotten, everybody's being very positive. That's exciting. Right, Delilah? We like that, right? Very exciting. Thank very you. Very exciting. Yeah. So we'll be asking some questions related to that as we go along, and you can see those are reflected on your device as well. And uh, as we ask other questions, they will have different types of responses in, in that same vein. All right, before I move forward, are there any other questions related to asking or using these particular products? And if you can ask them this, this one, I mean, if you have a question, you want to ask it to say, hey, I have a question. Uh, anybody like that? Are we good to go? I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you, Delilah. I'm going to move forward then. I want to start with this foundation piece. I have... For me, at least, when I work with adult degree completion, I like to start with a solid foundation. I know that you all are probably the same way. And so I'm working with a solid foundation that looks at what are we doing in this whole process. And, and the conception of adult degree programs specifically affects our campuses. Why are we doing those? And I think all of us would say the beginning point, the starting point in adult degree completion has always been for our campuses that we are serving an underserved population. We know that the average age of, of the students at our campuses is around 38. And that's pretty much consistent across all eight of our campuses. We have uh, students who are older that are underserved. And so that's what we're doing. But we also understand that there is a second rationale or a second reason why adult degree completion has been prominent. And that has to do with providing an, an alternate revenue stream. I actually feel pretty pleased about that. Uh, Christian higher education today, I'm not even confident it would exist or at least exist in the form that it has right now without adult degree completion. And, and I can say that with a great deal of confidence. A lot of schools would have closed without the extra influx of money that adult degree completion has brought into their programs. So because of adult degree completion, we are enabling the young people of our own homes and the homes of other Christians across the country to be able to attend a Christian university. That makes me pretty proud of what we do. We are not only educating an underserved population, but because of what we do, we are enabling our campuses to serve our own families and the families of our friends and neighbors and the world with the Christian education education. And so I think we're performing a, a, a literally crucial role in that whole process. And I'm so thankful that God has allowed me to work in adult degree completion programs. 
I want to move into that to the second piece here, and that's mission alignment. Does your adult degree completion work with your mission alignment? I'm confident that you've given that some thought. That's an important piece. And we need to have that awareness that, <clears throat> excuse me, that what we do actually lines up with the mission of the university. And, and I wouldn't hesitate at all to recommend to you that if you're not pulling out your mission statement and reflecting on pondering over it one, at least once or twice a year, and maybe even bringing it up at a faculty development workshop, maybe you want to think about doing that. And the second part here, a vision statement. What is the vision for your adult degree completion? I've been involved now with, this is my third adult degree completion campus, uh, university. Uh, each one had a slightly different vision for the adult degree completion program. And so your campus may have that. Do you know what that vision is? How does that vision impact what you do and how you do what you do? And then taking that forward to the next step in implementation. How are you implementing that vision or the pieces of that vision? And as you can see, that then flows over into this next list here, uh, staffing, budget, administrative model, marketing, recruiting, curriculum, faculty support, advising. Uh, these are just broad categories, but they overlap a lot, but they do kind of hit the high points of all that we do. We're involved in all of these pieces. We're involved in all of these activities that lead us to the place where we are actively working in these areas. And, and certainly, I, I could take time and talk about any of these and all of these and, and would be happy to do that at another point. But, but what we're doing today in this particular session is we're going to focus on specifically faculty. And I'm going to flip over to another product here just now and bring it up on the screen in front of you. And I want to talk about faculty. And I'm going to hit about... Uh, these five key points as I work through this presentation. And I want to start with this particular one. And I'm going to come back. Uh, the question that you've answered, asked over here, how crucial is it to provide faculty uh, with, the orient, with orientation to your institution? I believe that's crucial. I'm going to talk into that more. In fact, all of these, it looks like so far I can come back to all the questions that you've posted so far. But don't hesitate to ask more and, and continue to rank the questions you have. All right, who are they? Well, you know and I know that you have full-time people who are teaching for you who maybe get adult education and probably don't, um, honestly. I mean, even if they've taught adults in, in the traditional program, that doesn't mean they understand adult degree completion and what that's like. You have part-time faculty who you may have hired at your individual campuses who may or may not have some background. And then you have your adjuncts. And your adjuncts are those individuals who are literally, um, let's see, I'm going to make that a little bit larger. There we go. These, these are people who are, are professionals. They're working professionals. They're um, they're um, they're working professionals or the professional adjuncts. I like that professional adjunct piece because I think we see that, don't we, a lot of times, that, that we see an, a professional adjunct. So I've just posted another poll question for you. I want you to go over to the poll section of your thing and give that a quick answer. Approximately what percent of your faculty are adjuncts? Yeah, that's not surprising to me. With only six responders, we have uh, a majority of the faculty being above 75%. It's interesting that one is less than that, and that would be uh, really interesting to see what your, your dynamic is for, for the economies of scale there. But as you look at that, you can really begin to see that what we're dealing with primarily are adjuncts. Some of these will be working people who have jobs during the day and they teach for you at night. Others will be people who have only been teaching, but they teach at a multiple of universities and they teach adjunct for you and they teach adjunct for, for the next center in a university and they teach adjunct for the next university. That's basically who we're really dealing with in this process. These are our adjuncts that primarily make these programs work. And they are the ones, because of the dynamic of all of that, that make it work financially. Because of the use of adjuncts is why there is the influx of revenue into our campus sites. 
So how does it work? Well, it works because we have a familiarity with the course curriculum. They have experience and they have the education. So that's why it works with adjuncts. They, get, they have the education. If you are accredited, and I'm assuming all of you are in the room, then you know that they have a certain credit number of hours. I think it varies from region to region. When I was up in the northern area, HLC said approximately 15 hours. Uh, SACS has been very, at, not, not just kind of encouraging, SACS is adamant about this 18 credit hours in a subject area, which is literally a killer. And so they have to have the education. It's great if they have experience in the field. In fact, it's preferable if they do because it provides the students a great background. And of course, we have the familiarity with the course curriculum. So that's, that's kind of how it all works together. That's why adjuncting works. They come in with these background and they'd be able to bring that to the classroom. But, but what are they? And I think this is kind of a piece that I want to spend a couple of seconds on and before we get to the real meat of this presentation. What is a faculty person generally doing in the classroom? Well, as you can see, I've got six different pieces pointed out there. They are mentors. Uh, they, are, they are working to provide a kind of relationships that allows them to be perceived of as a mentor. Uh, they are facilitators of content. They are working with the the students not merely to disseminate information, but to facilitate learning, and that's an important part of that process. They're role models, and I am so thankful that by and large, our adult faculty come to the classes that they teach dressed uh, semi-professionally at least. I mean, they don't all wear suits and ties, but some of them wear ties, but many of them are all in polo shirts or dressed professionally. I have very, very rarely seen a faculty person coming in uh, in jeans and a t-shirt and certainly would discourage that for adult degree completion because, again, part of the process is setting a role model. They're the content experts, and I think that goes without saying. They bring their expertise into the classroom. They provide some guidance, how that fits and how the theory actually fits in with the practice, and I think that's so crucial for our students, that guiding step and then their peers and many of them see that uh, many times the students in the classroom will be older than the faculty individuals and for them to be able to come in and see them as colleagues and peers really does increase the opportunity for a, a camaraderie and a collegiality that leads to learning so I'm I'm excited that that happens as well so that's that's what they are and now I want to talk about why it works and we'll start here at efficient processes. If it works at your institution, it works because you have efficient processes. And I'm not just talking with the faculty. I'm talking about the whole scope of things. I can't tell you. I've, been, I've worked in three universities, and I've seen um, excellent processes, and I've seen processes that make me shake my head saying, why in the world are we doing this that way? Have any of you experienced that? Why in the world would we do this that way? There's so many other better ways to do it. If you haven't experienced that, maybe you've not been in the business long enough because I gotta tell you, poor processes are rampant, but there is an ability to make them better and to make them more efficient. I think passion is part of the reason why it works too. There is a, one of the institutions I worked at, there was this really excited culture that we are changing lives. And while I don't know that I say that is exactly the same culture that exists right now at Bellhaven, there is a strong culture that cares for the student and is passionate about caring for the student. What is the culture and what is the passion at your campus for your students and how does that reflect and, and pass on to the students? There's a sense of mission, mission about what we're doing, that, that I'm involved in, in something greater than merely what what is a job. I'm doing this for more than simply a paycheck. And then I bring in my faith and I allow my faith to permeate the entire experience and be able to fill up that experience and, and, uh, and make it really richer. I, I say this and, and I know it's true that the students who come into our programs aren't really looking for a faith integration. And, and I don't know what you know about Bellhaven University. But Bellhaven University has probably one of the most thorough and well-done integration of Christian worldview aspects into its curriculum of any place that I've ever seen. Literally, it it's permeates every course, and, and it's done well, I believe, so that the students come out of those courses understanding not only 
what the subject is about, but how it impacts the Christian worldview. And so that by the time they graduate, whether they wanted to get a good Christian understanding or wanted to understand of a Christian worldview, they have a really solid integration concept of what that means in their specific field that enables them to go forth with confidence. And we hear this time and time and again from graduates that, yeah, I learned a lot in my business program, but what I really learned a lot about was how it impacts my Christian worldview and how, it, how I am now impacting my world and the places where I work. And that's very exciting for us. Relationships is part of why it works. Um, I have a, a solid belief that all of life can be reduced to relationships and that our relationship with each other reflects our relationship with God. And we try and share that and we try and live that with our students and with our faculty that we want to relate to them. We're not just trying to be bosses. We're trying to be uh, on a team working together to accomplish a goal. There's got to be a certain amount of humility involved in the process as well. As you can probably tell already, I struggle a little bit on that side. Humility is a, a big deal. It's an aspect of allowing God to be primary and focused. And then, and then, it, and then it really comes back to that word leadership. Uh, another life principle of mine is, is everything rises and falls on leadership. I know I stole that from Maxwell and others, but it's true, isn't it? Everything rises and falls on leadership. And if it's working at your institution, if your adult degree program is working and functioning well, it's because of leadership working in all the various categories and, and, and aspects of that program. Well, now I'm going to come up here and talk to you a little bit about why it breaks. Because sometimes it breaks. And I want to talk about that because the, in relationship specifically to faculty, I think we see some disconnect and breaking. And, and I've got four points there. Um, and, and we can start at any direction. I'll start at the top poor orientation and lack of faculty development. That's one of the reasons why we have disconnects. That's one of the reasons why we have problems with our faculty in the classroom. That's one of the reasons why it doesn't seem as if the outcomes are happening. It doesn't seem as if we're getting good successful course completion rates. It doesn't seem as if we're getting good student retention. It doesn't seem as if we're getting good scores on uh, student on customer service surveys and part of that I believe goes directly back to the fact that we have not done an adequate job in giving the appropriate foundations to our faculty orientation and our faculty development processes. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in just a few minutes. Lack of connection and I think this is hand in glove with that. Uh, do your faculty feel connected to your institution? What have you done to connect your faculty to your institution? And I'm going to give you a quick illustration of that. Um, you realize all of these illustrations are, are actually in context, if you will. So they, they may or may not apply to your institution. But last year, we came out with uh, kind of a major update to our faculty handbook. And we wanted everybody to read the faculty handbook. And so instead of mandating it per se, uh, we, we actually partnered with another, another aspect of our university. And uh, if they read the faculty handbook and confirmed that through, I think it was a short quiz or something, Ron, I don't know what we did. Um, they actually received a, a uh, polo shirt with the word instructor on Are you wearing it right now, Ron? Oh yeah, stand up and stand up and model that bad boy. There you go. Very nice. All right. So we gave all the faculty uh, a shirt last year. There are other ways to to provide connection, but that's one way you can provide connection. And and so that lack of connection also plays against you because the less connection a faculty person experiences, the more they treat the the work as a job. And that's what we have to avoid. It's not a job, ladies and gentlemen. It's a calling. You don't work at our institutions because you're going to get rich. Because you aren't going to get rich working at our institutions. It's At least at Bellhaven, you're not. You're not going to get rich. You're actually going to uh, probably take a little bit of a cut if you work at some other institutions. Um, unclear expectations. And I think this is rampant. We have... Um, done our best to improve the quality of our documents, our faculty handbooks, our policies and procedures manuals, which we use for the administration side. We have done our best to make sure those are clear, but we also communicate those often in our expectations. And as you see, we'll, I'll share with you how it connects back into 
excuse me, our orientation as well. And then there's poor accountability because if you don't check it, if you don't hold anybody accountable, they will, there will be slippage. That's just a fact of life. And we put some really interesting safeguards into place. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about faculty accountability and, and how we have put some safeguards into place for that that I think have really upped the game for our faculty and brought them more into that fold and into the connection and culture of our university. So hopefully if you have questions, um, you are going to go ahead and continue to post those and rank the ones that are posted. And I am going to move now to alignment is the key. And this is really the, the key aspect of the presentation today. I took, I took the first 20 minutes to set it up. I'm sorry, guys. It was a setup. I set you up for the first part. Here we go. I'm going to talk about the orientation. All right. Here's the faculty orientation. Let's see. There we go. All right. We have, when I came to Bellhaven University, and as I was mentioning before the session started, we have, uh, we had at that time uh, seven campuses. I believe that's still correct. Yeah. Seven campuses. We're just moving to an eighth one this fall. So we had seven campuses, and at the seven campuses, we were doing orientations at each campus for the faculty coming in. Uh, every, every campus would do their own orientation, um, and it, in some cases, was laid out on paper. Other times, it was done very casually. Um, and as I came in and looked at what we were doing and picked the pieces that we had at the various campuses, I realized that we had some serious gaps in that entire process. In almost every case, we had a gap in one or two of the areas that you see presented on your screen there. But, but there were more in some cases and less in others. And so we began, I began to think about how we could do this in a way that would be effective for everyone. And so you can see the different pieces there. But what I'm going to pop over for you now is a look at our actual, let's see, our actual orientation here. Now, this is in Canvas. So we have a Canvas orientation, and we have a firm policy in place that no faculty person, no new faculty person, because I had to grandfather in the old ones, although I provided incentives for the old ones to complete the orientation. Uh, but no, we didn't require the old ones to complete it, but we have required all the new ones to complete it, and we've incentivized some of the old ones to complete it. No new faculty person teaches for us without going through the orientation. Nobody. Everybody goes through an orientation. Everybody has to do with the pieces. And it's set up in Canvas in a way that goes through these pieces. So you can see here's the sections on the welcome and introduction. Um, there's the instructions. I have a video introduction, a video welcome to the program. Uh, we provide a profile of Bellhaven University. We give them a tour of the main campus virtually. Uh, there are some campus-specific information pieces here. Uh, a link to a little video about adult studies at, at Bellhaven, the Worldview, Worldview Faculty Guide. I have to say that three times fast. Academic Leadership uh, for Adult Studies, Introduction Quiz. Now, the Introduction Quiz, I'm going to pop over to it real quick here. Um, I don't want to show you the questions. I guess I can't pop directly into a preview. Here we go. All right. It, it's uh, a few questions. Who is the VP? Uh, who is Bell, where is Bellhaven's main campus? Three or four questions that refer back to the content. All right. Now, what happens when they take this orientation quiz, this first quiz, which none of the questions are complex, it opens up the second section. They can't get to the second section without finishing the first section. That's crucial because otherwise faculty will skim and, and actually do nothing because they're busy people, not because they're unethical, they're just busy people and they just think they can skim because most faculty are, are even have a worse time with humility than I do, maybe, I don't know. And so they think, I, don't, I already know all this stuff, why do I need to do that, I don't need to do that, I really, have, I just don't need it. And so by pushing this, I, I push them to do that. So they have to pass the quiz. I even set it up so they could earn a badge uh, that, that goes with that. And uh, Canvas allows a badge, so there's a badge, role of the faculty, faculty orientation, uh, they can get different badges for, for completing each of the section. I don't know if those are important or not. I haven't heard anybody say, oh, goody, give me a badge. But then again, who knows? Um, so there, that's the first one, welcome and introduction. The next one is the role of the instructor. And in section two in the role of the instructor, instructor we have uh, 
uh, role of the instructor related to the mission. You see, because that's important. I want them to understand why they're doing what they're doing. Talk of the role of the faculty. These are little videos that we've put together. Uh, they're not high production videos. A lot of them are screen capture videos that I've done sitting here at my desk. I'm not going to wait on perfection to get the job done. I'm going to get the job done and I'm going to get it out there and then I can go back and tweak it as necessary. But I need my faculty to have the understanding of how what they're doing relates to the mission, what their role is, who the adult learner is, what the adult andragogical instructor actually looks like, what it means to have collaborative teaching in the classroom. I'm going to talk about the faculty resources blog. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. And then, bang, there's another quiz. They have to complete this quiz in order to drop down to the next one, which talks about policies and procedures. Altogether, um, this, this orientation probably takes between 10 and maybe 15 hours. I don't know. Would you say that's fair, Ron? Yeah, so it takes about 10 to 15 hours for them to complete. Could be less, you know, if they watched all the videos, it'll be less. They're going to skim some of it no matter what I do, but it's all going to be here for them. And we put them in the process so that they, they do all of that and they get to the very end. And I'm going to scroll down here to the end of the piece. And here's at our various campuses, and I love this piece as well. Because at our various campuses, you see, we have, we have all these campuses. And so every campus has its own little welcome video by the dean. It has uh, a campus location, which tells them it walks them through the classes. So before they ever even show up on campus, or even if they've never just come in and meet the dean, they can actually get a tour of the campus, see the classroom, see what's available, see how it all works. Uh, and they can and get specific questions answered, like, is there food available? Where's the closest place to do that? How are the directions? What about parking? And so all of that's available here as well. So they complete all of that. And at that point, um, down at the bottom, the last section, excuse me, is resources. And this resources page includes different, different aspects or different pieces that might be relevant. For instance, the Peregrine for the MHA. Uh, waiver forms, grade change forms, oral evaluation forms, all of them are available here. Once they complete the orientation, we mark them as complete and pull them out of Canvas, but still give them access to the material. So every student, every faculty person has access to the orientation having gone through it, but they're not listed in, in my people list so that I have a long list I don't have a list that's 17 miles long. I have a list that's manageable and every week. Now, this is a key part in this orientation. I started this when I came uh, a little over three years ago. Every week that we have our virtual staff meeting, I talk about the orientation because I've learned enough about change management to understand that if I don't embed this deeply in the culture, if I personally don't take ownership for embedding it in the culture as a leader of the program, if I rely upon anybody else to do that, or if I just say, hey, we're going to do it, and then I just pass it off and say, hey, I expect you to do it. If I don't personally come back to it on a regular basis and say, hey, we're not putting anybody in the classroom unless they complete the orientation, and I'm signing certificates every week, and I'm mentioning it at our virtual staff meeting, who's, who's completed the orientation, which ones are doing it, and it's on our agenda every week about this, the faculty orientation. Why? Because I believe this faculty orientation is probably one of the best things that we do here at Bellhaven University to prepare our faculty to be a part of what we are attempting to do with our students. I cannot overstate, I cannot even begin to overstate the importance of a faculty orientation that literally comes to all of these pieces and puts it together. Now, on your screen, in your poll section here, I'd like you to, uh, to see, I've got another poll question I'm posting right now, and if you'd go back to your device, I'd like you to go ahead and, and vote on that particular, particular question.
Interesting. Okay. Well, as you can see the responses there, there is a, a variety of responses related to, to that particular question. Let's see if I can come back over here. And, yep. Very good. So you can see the responses there. I, again, I, I, can't, I cannot overstate, I can't come back and say that, that this, is, this is a kind of an if statement. For me, if we don't have a good orientation, then that speaks to, to my leadership, really. And so I want to emphasize that with you. Putting an orientation in place is crucial. If any of you want, um, if you would like for me to review your orientation for thoroughness, I would be thrilled to do that. Just let me know if you want any kind of consulting work on that. And I'm not talking to getting paid. I'm just talking collegiality. I'll be happy to, to help you with that if you have an issue. But I, I really want to encourage you, getting your faculty oriented and particularly setting that philosophy piece at the very beginning. I, I tell you what, this is crucial for us. We need to, our faculty to understand why we're doing what we're doing. The the educational philosophy that is a part of our programs and, and the, the deep connection that we have to the mission. If those aren't communicated, there will be a disconnect and faculty will see it and it will become a job. And when it's a job, it never is going to attain what you want it to attain. All right. I hope that's raising some more questions. I hope you're continuing to post questions in, the, in Slido as we go along. And now I want to talk a little bit about accountability. All right, accountability, wow. It, we have to do that, and you probably, all of you have student evaluations. In fact, one of the questions that's posted here is upon uh, evaluations. How do you evaluate? Let's see, it's rolled off the bottom here. Well, I don't see it, but I thought I saw one a moment ago about student evaluations. How do you evaluate online faculty? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and honestly, one of the things that we're experimenting with with online faculty, uh, well, I'll come, since I'll, well, I'll talk about online. One of the things we're experimenting with online faculty, which I think has the greatest promise for us, is, a, is an integration piece with Canvas. We're trying a couple of different pieces right now, and we haven't settled on the right one. Uh, once we do get it settled, we'll probably roll it out to our on-ground sites as well. But for online faculty, they, last week won't open for them until they complete their orientation. Our online courses are eight weeks in length, so they can complete seven weeks, but they can't open their eighth week material until they complete their orientation. And I believe that model is probably what we're going to adopt in our on-ground classes once we can prove that it works and that we can get a reasonable return on the, or the evaluations. Student evaluations are important because it gives us good feedback. Um, our people have designed uh, using Tableau, a stoplight system that measures all faculty uh, in the overall scores for that evaluation set of questions. So there's an average of scores for that evaluation questions. And we also have an evaluation of scores for the Christian worldview questions, because that's an important part of what we do at Bellhaven University. So we take those scores, and that that brackets using Tableau into a stoplight format so that I can see at a glance every student evaluation that comes back compiled by class. So it's not every evaluation, but all the evaluations for MBA or M MSL 601. I can see all the evaluations that come back for a specific section or for a specific instructor. And I can see where that falls. Is it, is it red, yellow, or green? And if it's green, hey, everything's great and groovy and we go on. If it's, if it's less than that, because I see that for all of our, fa all of our eight campuses, it's, because it's a stoplight system, it's very, very easy for me to just skim down the list and say, okay, we've got some, some areas here that are a problem. And I send a list um, every semester to the deans at the various campuses saying, hey, what about John? What about Bill? Uh, what do you think? Are we going to be able to continue to use Bill? Is there a chance that we can remediate Bill? Or do we just need to kind of maybe not stop and stop using Bill going forward? Uh, what are your thoughts? And the faculty person or the deans write back and say, you know what? Uh, here's, why, here's why I think Bill got that score. We've talked about this. 
and I believe I have a good handle on what's going on, and uh, we're going to work forward, and, and we'll just keep track of it for next time. Or, you know what, I've talked with Bill about this, and it's still the same way as it's been last time when you talked to me about it, and so I'm going to just discontinue using Bill. We're able, since I've gotten here and we have implemented this system, we have literally eliminated almost all of our problem faculty. We, we only have people teaching for us who are getting great scores or we know why they're getting bads and we're able to remediate them. We don't just allow poor faculty to teach for us over and over and over. We are doing our best to make sure that we have the, the top of the people who will work for us, working for us. So we use those evaluations. And then we also use classroom observations. All of the deans at my various campuses are involved in classroom observations. And uh, that's part of their responsibility. Again, about two years ago now, uh, we implemented a process where they put those in a shared document, a summary. So for instance, Ron sitting there would actually uh, post his evaluations that he made in a given month with a summary, who he, who he reviewed, a summary of what happened while he was in the class, and we have a review page that they use, and he would score that and put a score there. And so because of that, again, it's accountability. The deans are holding the faculty accountable. I'm holding the deans accountable, and that means observations are happening because you guys know if you put observations on your list and you get busy, what's going to get bumped? You know observations get bumped. I know observations get bumped because I bumped them when I was doing the dean's job because they're just, there's so much things to do. There's so many things to do. So by putting this accountability thing in place, it's now possible for me to see that all the campuses are doing their observations. I'm getting good scores and the quality of our faculty is continuing to improve or we're doing remediation and evaluation. So we're constantly involved in faculty improvement. We're doing the orientation to make sure they're coming up to a higher standard from the very get-go and know why they're doing what they're doing. And then we're coming back into the second piece and we're observing them. We're getting the TEBS, of the end of course evaluations from students, and we're also getting the observations done by the deans. This is crucial for us. And that, that contributes to the analytics piece that I put there. And that's what that is in reference to. I probably should put it as a sub-issue sub of, of observations, analytics, and just kind of drink it, drop it up here like that. Okay. So that analytics is a part of that. So we are really working with our observations and accountability to make sure that we are holding our faculty to high standards and attempting to do remediation with them in cases where it's appropriate and in cases where it's not appropriate, um, we simply discontinue using them. And I'll talk more about that because I see that's in some of your questions over here at the side. 427, I'm gonna kind of press onto this last one and then answer questions. Faculty development. All right, faculty development. We have put together a blog, and I'm going to show you that real quickly here. Let's see, here we go. Faculty resources blog. It is blogs.bellhaven.edu slash AS faculty. Blogs.bellhaven.edu slash AS faculty. All right. Now, the reason this is important, and I actually put this whole thing together after attending Cahia, I don't know, three years ago now, and saw a great presentation by Indiana Wesleyan on their blog site. And so I, I subscribed to their blog site. I still get their blog posts, and I decided to put together our own blog. And so we have a blog that is contributed to by myself. Here's a post by Dean Ruddle, who is our dean in Houston. Uh, all of my deans and some of the faculty post to the, to the blog. And here's the categories over here. Now, um, we're posting summaries of, we're posting these blog posts, we're posting other things. But note in these, like classroom management, I click on classroom management, and it's going to take me to that post that you just saw. But all of the articles that I'm going to be scrolling down through here are classroom management related. And because of that, I can come back to this whole concept of talking about about remediation and I can say okay if you've got a faculty person who's struggling with one aspect take them to take them to the blog and have them look at all the articles related to this and then sit down and talk with them that way I can I have a I have a place 
where I can put in their hands remediation tools that I know of good because I put them together or others of my deans and faculty have put them together that will give them information and then my deans can use that for talking with them. And then there's face-to-face -face faculty development. In our case, we have on-campus physical face-to-face -face faculty orientation twice a year. Faculty are required to attend one of those in order to stay active and we monitor attendance on a shared document so that we can keep up with those who don't. If they miss two, they can continue to teach until that third time, and if they don't attend by that third time, then they are suspended until they attend an orientation. So we're not trying to be punitive necessarily, but we want our faculty to be connected to what we're doing. And these orientations are, are from basically nine to noon on a Saturday, and generally, filled with food and a lot of good fellowship and generally good responses across the board. Uh, we put together webinars on a regular basis. I think about 80 a year there are webinars that I put together uh, that I coordinate with various people to put a webinar together and so we'll share a live webinar and we'll record it and back out on our blog site there's a whole list of those webinars that faculty can go and look at and you could subscribe to this if you wanted to. I mean it's just blogs.bellhaven.edu slash asfaculty. If you went to that site, you could subscribe by email and you'll get a copy every time a blog is posted. And if you go to faculty resources over here and scroll down a little bit, you can see that we have a whole list of webinars here. Google Docs in the classroom, plagiarism, helping your students avoid it, APA grading and writing, using Bloom's taxonomy to foster critical thinking, Christian worldview, practical applications for the classroom. So there are a lot of webinars on a lot of different topics that we use. Again, that can be used as well for remediation purposes. And so that allows you the opportunity to do that, to be able to get uh, and have that remediation piece as well. So that kind of takes us through all of the, of the uh, pieces that are a part of this. Let me see if I can, uh, let's go back this way and uh, pull it up and You've seen it all, and I'm going to come back over and answer questions. Don't hesitate now as we come back over to answering questions because we're getting close to time. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, uh, now's the time to continue to do them and to continue to post uh, likes or dislikes. And I'm going to kind of work down from the top, if that's okay, and answer questions. I know I'm talking too. Am I talking way too fast? Yeah. No, you're doing fine. Okay, I talk fast, I know I do. Um, how crucial is it to provide faculty with the orientation at your institution? Absolutely 100, won't let anybody in the classroom without it. If they don't take the orientation, I don't even want them to teach for me. Uh, how do you get the faculty to read? That's a, that's a really interesting question all on its own, let alone, <laughs> let alone the answer to the question itself. Just the fact that you have faculty who don't read is a question. I would, I would have to say if, if there are faculty who aren't reading, I would want to look at what kind of evaluations that we're getting from the students, what kind of evaluations that we're getting from classroom observations, um, and how do you know they're not reading? That's a good question. And what, what's your foundation for them not reading the material? It's probably they're not reading some of the textbook, probably most of the textbook. And if your curriculum is anything like ours, uh, it assigns far too much reading in a week. Than, I shouldn't have said that out loud, but it does. It assigns far too much reading in a week than is practical to be done. Uh, if you, if it's they've read the, if it's just teaching it the very first time, I can almost understand why they might not have read it all going in. I mean, almost understand it. They're still getting paid to teach, so they should do a good job, but they don't. Um, so I guess that's what I would do. I would look at their scores, uh, their observation scores, their evaluation scores, and. Uh, and I would try to determine how that's affecting that and maybe sit down and build a relationship and discuss it with them. And if I didn't feel that they were working at a level that I was comfortable with, if they weren't reading at a level I was comfortable with, I simply wouldn't hire them again. I just, I would just say, you know what? Um, and this is a question later down here, but do I fire fac adjunct faculty? No, don't ever fire an adjunct faculty person, ladies and gentlemen. I can tell you this from personal experience. This is not a good plan. Don't do it. Just simply don't use them. Your comment to them is, when a class becomes available for which I feel you are qualified and the best choice for, I will definitely consider getting you scheduled. 
That's the statement. You say it, and you walk away and leave it alone. But you don't ever fire adjunct faculty. You don't ever tell them you're never going to use them again. You don't ever, ever blame your administration. You don't ever blame anybody above you and saying, they told me I can't use you anymore. You stand up and be the leader and you say, okay, um, I've, in your own mind, you say to yourself, I've decided that this is not a good person for us. And so if they ask you about why you aren't scheduling me, you say, well, you know what? If a class becomes available for which I think you're the, good, the best fit, I will, I will schedule you. But at this point, I don't have any classes available that I can give you. You may think that's disingenuous, but I can tell you there are lawsuits waiting for you on almost any other avenue. And you need to be cautious about putting yourself and your institution in line of a lawsuit. So just think very, very carefully. And, and if, you, if, you, you know, if you don't like your job, I guess you can blame your boss. But if you like your job, I wouldn't be blaming my boss why I wasn't using somebody. Because if you don't think that'll come back and bite you, then you really are naive. Okay. How much do we pay our faculty? Not enough. Uh, that's not the best answer, is it? You want to know? There is no right answer for that. Um, the best answer is to probably pay slightly above the middle in your market. Um, maybe 10 to 15% above the middle in your market if you can afford to do that. But there is no right answer, and you will get better people, maybe, teaching for you if you have higher salary, uh, and maybe not. So uh, there, there really isn't a good answer for how much you pay your faculty. And, and honestly, it is market-driven. I hate to believe that, but it is market-driven. So whatever the market in your area is, if you're paying above middle, I think you're doing well. And if you're paying well above middle, uh, your faculty probably love you, and you probably have an easier time getting your faculty. But um, if if fac if pay is the only reason they're teaching for you, you probably you may not be getting the best faculty anyway. In in one sense of the word, I talked about evaluating online faculty. Uh, what is the best way to fire adjuncts who aren't a good fit? I'm, that's the one I was just addressing a moment ago. What type of incentives do you provide for faculty? Again, not nearly enough. In fact. Other than that shirt thing we did last year, I don't think we do anything on a regular basis. Um, I don't think we do anything. I mean, when they come to faculty workshops, uh, sometimes we give them stuff. We buy them food for that as well. So I guess there are the incentives of faculty workshop, but I, I really can't think of, of any other incentives that we do as a system. Ron may do something at Chattanooga for his faculty that I, I don't know. Um, if he does or not. Um, some of the other deans may do something for their faculty. I don't know if they do or not. Um, sometimes you can do good things for some faculty. I know on some institutions, Southern Nazarene University, for instance, uh, I know has a, um, a leveling system for their faculty, which um, I, I was working with uh, Davis, Barry, Davis Berryman a little bit on that, and he showed me the scale for that. Is that you, Davis, right there? Okay. Yeah, not here. Oh, okay. Um, so I worked with Davis Berryman just a little bit on that, and uh, he showed me what he had there, and and we talked about that briefly. So I think that's I think it's great if you can have a leveling thing. We've not been able to work that out, uh, and I think it's great if you can, but it's it's a bear to work out. I can tell you that. Um, is the orientation the same for the campus and the online? At our institution, it is not the same. Um, it might be the same at some of your institutions, but it's not the same at Bellhaven University. So, boy, I hope that's been helpful. We're coming in pretty close to time. Unless there's any last-minute questions you have, I'd be happy to answer anything. It's good to see some of you again, and it's been a real pleasure to, to share with you in this way. Um, how, how have you liked using Slido? Let me post another question for you here. I'm going to post another question. Um, here's another question for you. So look at your Slido and see if you can do that. Here's a question that has been asked to me, uh, boy, many, 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 many times. And it'll be interesting to see what your answers are.
yeah, that's that's pretty much what I expected. And uh, it, you know what? If you've not started paying your faculty and they say, well, if you'd pay us, we'd come. I honestly wouldn't recommend paying your faculty to come to orientation. If you are paying your faculty to come to orientation, I don't see how you can stop without uh, a lot of upheaval. But there's no reason necessarily they're going to come or they're not going to come. And if you use an incentive such as, you know, you have to do that to stay active, uh, they'll make a way to do that. That's just kind of, kind of what will happen in that process. So interesting question. And I'll look back over here and see if there are any other questions you may have. I think we answered that one. What is the best thing to connect? Oh, let's see. What is the best thing you have done to connect your adjuncts? We talked about that. I'm going to see how crucial is it to provide faculty orientation. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right, so we've got all the questions answered. One last poll question, and I, again, I'm gonna come back over here and post this back up on the screen. And uh, let's see this piece here. Here we go. Okay, I wanna come down to this one right here. All right, and um, here we go. Oh, I wanted to do that too. On your uh, hamburger menu, on the side of your uh, poll, on the side of your of your the little hamburger menu at the top, if you pull that down, there's a place to put in a social post. I really encourage you to post a a social post on Twitter. Just put something in there. It'll automatically post to the Kahia 2017 thread. Uh, maybe like, hey, this was the best best presentation that I have ever been at in my entire. You know, something general like that, and and that would be great. And uh, if you post that, that'd be good. And then here's some information about myself. In case you want to contact me, I'm glad for you to do that in any way, and I'll be happy to help you in any way. And I posted one last thing in the poll section for you as, as we complete the end here, and would appreciate you doing that and letting me know as well. I have recorded this presentation, and we'll make it available uh, with uh, the Cahia folks so that they can have it uh, for use I don't think I said anything embarrassing. Ron, did I say anything I shouldn't have? I don't think, I think I'm okay. So, okay, great. So that's kind of where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. I've really, really enjoyed being with you today. And thank you for the opportunity of sharing this way and for uh, taking your time out of the conference to be there. I wish I could be there with you to sit around the table and have a conversation about some of these topics. Uh, God bless you all. Any, any final comments, questions you have? Thank you, Rick. So Thank much. you, Delilah. All right. God bless everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right. All right.